So, I know it's weird because we've drawn our drawing, we've got notes, we've worked on or will work on information underneath the drawing. So, I feel like your information is kind of all over the place, but you'll notice that there's a careful way of saying something to demonstrate what the expectations are for your level of understanding. So when they say summarize the Krebs cycle, they are not wanting you to speak to something that looks like that. So they're not wanting you to go through here and name all of these. Although we are going to add that level of detail into our drawing just because we want to make the point that as these molecules are rearranged into more molecularly stable um, molecules, so each one of these is more stable, less energetic, then that's how you do release these um, the, the energy enough to make ATP at this one place through conformational change and then also through bond breaking with the release of these carbons as carbon dioxide, which generates high energy electrons that are going to be carried off by NADH. But when they say summarize, they're not wanting that. Probably the most important way to think about um, all of these processes is you want to think about inputs and outputs, like what went in and what goes out. That really gives you the ability to think about, well, what if one of those is missing or you're not able? Then you can make some conversations or make some statements around whether that whole process slows down, shuts down, what happens, or an alternate pathway begins. So I just want us to focus on this summarize. Now I am going to put a video after this set of notes that's pretty detailed and they walk you through exactly what happens in every single step. So I'm not asking you to memorize that, but there's something about seeing the molecules literally change that helps with the understanding of what's going on. So one part that we we need to add is yes, we're starting with the Krebs cycle, but nowhere has anything asked us to summarize the steps of breaking down pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, which can go in the Krebs cycle. So we're going to add that we're going to go through the steps of pyruvate oxidation. Now, um, some older type of things, which I think the video does too, they'll call it oxidative decarboxylation, I think. So all they're saying is you're removing a carbon. And now pretty much we call it pyruvate oxidation, remembering that oxidation means breaking down. So that's the word that's a better use of the term, that you're going to break down pyruvate. So we'll start there and we'll just make the ins and the outs. So starting with pyruvate, which this is really step two in cellular respiration. So up here, glycolysis, um, where must they go? That's step one. And we're talking all here about cellular respiration, which is using glucose oxidation to form ATP. <clears throat> so we may or may not come back in there and fill this out. It's everywhere all through here. But we're going to start with pyruvate. So when we left our story, we had gone through glycolysis, we claimed it, we licked the, floor, the fork, right, claimed it, 
energized it enough to split it. So glycolysis is snapping glucose in half from one six to two, th two threes. Those go through some just conformational changes so that the molecule is rearranged in a, now it's in a lower energy state and you gain electron carriers and some substrate level phosphorylation here with just a few ATPs and you ended up with pyruvate. Pyruvate moves into this transport protein and it's gated. We'll talk about that when we get to the next question. And then it's symported, okay, using the hydrogen ion concentration gradient that's so high in this inner membrane space to drive pyruvate into the matrix against its concentration gradient. And once everything's in the matrix, then you're able to start the rest of what we're doing. So we're right here. This is where we are. So we have three carbons. Now we're going to do this times two. So this part right here for one glucose. So you'll have this happen twice. In pyruvate oxidation, you're going to lose a carbon dioxide because you're going to break one of the carbons off. And you have a two carbon molecule, which is the acetyl-CoA, or the acetyl molecule that becomes acetyl-CoA that can go into Krebs. And as you break that bond, you're going to generate we'll put them over here, electrons that will be picked up by NAD and be reduced to NADH. So this is pyruvate oxidation. Then we're going to go and do the Krebs cycle. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight those so that the steps are separate. I didn't see this. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> There's always something. So now we've got these two carbon molecules. So we'll start with that really in between here. Um, in fact, we might just want to put it like right here. That will bring a CoA and you end up with this acetyl-CoA ready to go into let me put this in a box to show that we've got an NADH. So this is the process. Pyruvate is oxidized to form acetyl. Acetyl is merged with CoA, which is we've talked about those, and then you form this acetyl-CoA. So we start here with this acetyl-CoA now that's getting ready to enter into Krebs. And what happens at this point is the CoA is removed and you just have the two carbon and it's added to the beginning of the Krebs cycle. So this oxaloacetate, this 4C, this 4 carbon molecule is what the Krebs cycle begins and ends with. So you end up with a 6 carbon molecule. And then we'll, so this is getting ready to start the cycle. So now we'll start the Krebs cycle. So this 6 carbon goes through a couple of changes first, but we're just doing a summary, remember. So it, it's going to lose one carbon, and it's going to lose it as carbon dioxide. And then as you break this bond, you're going to generate high energy electrons that NAD will pick up and be reduced to NADH. Then your five carbon is also going to be oxidized. It's going to lose a carbon as carbon dioxide. And this 
bond breaking generated high energy electrons that are going to go to NADH and you go through some conformational changes before you regenerate this first four carbon molecule. So one of the conformational changes generates ATP. So it's just the structural rearrangement that goes into a more um, stable energy state molecule and that is enough energy for substrate level phosphorylation to occur and an ATP to be generated there. Then there's another conformational change where that one four carbon is changed into another one and that actually results in high energy electrons being generated. But in this case, you're going to have FAD2, which is the oxidized form, pick up those electrons, be reduced to FADH2. And then one last conformational change and that regenerates this four carbon molecule that's here. And when that occurs, there are, inter, there are high energy electrons generated and NAD is reduced to NADH. At this point, there's no more, there's no more carbons. So I try to explain Krebs because a lot of times, and, and I see the point, why can't you just break those two instead of this complicated, crazy mess where that you have the two, you know, that's what your energy is left. So if you think about it, you had the energy originally in these six carbons, right? And through glycolysis, you ended up with one of these bonds being broken and now you have two carbons and the goal is to have no carbons that's the whole point that's what oxidation means it breaks it all apart so once you I see that this is what I'm seeing this is what I understand hey I took a three carbon I broke a carbon off it left as carbon dioxide I have a two carbon why didn't we just do this again and go from two to, to like both of them broken that seems so much simpler. It's hard to explain energetically the reasoning behind this. And this it seems silly, but it's the best example that I have as far as my brain trying to help you understand. So if you've got, okay, let's just go with this. If you've ever been to the jeweler and you've got something small, like this ring, and you're going to do something, I don't know, maybe set a stone in it. You're going to work on it, but it's super tiny, and it's hard to do anything with. They'll put it in a clamp that's like my fingers to hold it, and the clamp's job is not to be used up. It's just to allow you to do what you need to do with the small, unwieldy thing. So if we think about the two carbon acetyl as the ring and everything going on in Krebs as my fingers or the clamp, it's just easier to break bonds off as far as rearranging and doing and getting the energy First of all, if you do it stepwise, there's lots of steps in Krebs. But second of all, if you do it as part of a larger molecule instead of a tiny one. So that's a silly kind of way to think about it, but I hope it helps you see that once you get down to the little stuff, like this little two carbon piece, they're not easy to work on like they are. So we hold it in Krebs and we cycle it around and then we will snap those two carbons off. So we do break it. We just don't do it as its own tiny little piece. I don't know how else to explain that. Okay. 
So let's think about inputs and outputs. We're going to make a big table for everything. But in this particular case, let's think about what happens just in Krebs because that's what we were talking about. So what we would get for each turn, knowing that there's two turns for each of the glucose molecules because every glucose is going to create two pyruvates. So one turn, two turns. So for each turn, We'll just come over here and count what we've got. You ended up making one, two, three NADH that will shuttle those electrons off to the electron transport chain. You made one FADH2 and you made one ATP. It started as GTP, pretty much immediately was converted to ATP but we're going to be careful with that so we know what we did. So this is per turn. So for each glucose, you're going to double that. So you're going to have six Na, whoops, NADHs, right? You'll have two FADH2s, two GTPs that become ATP, and that's what you get in Krebs. Now, we didn't say what else that you ended up with. Per turn, you also generated two carbon dioxide, their waste. Isn't that weird? Like, the glucose is a carbon-based molecule, and it reminds me of the Brady Bush Bunch with, like, carbon, 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 Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Everything's carbon, carbon, carbon. Well, it's just a waste. So these will diffuse out, and then they'll be released as a waste product. And so you would end up with the two carbons that went in as the acetyl group, leaving the matter part of it, this is the matter, going back out into the universe to be recycled again through some type of carbon dioxide fixation. So you would end up with four because you'd have two acetyl groups, turn, turn for Krebs, and they end up just, this is where you show that the matter leaves. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So this part right through here, we're beginning to get the sense of, wait, so I'm fixated here on carbon, 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 but down here you tell me nobody cares. Hmm. Maybe we shouldn't care so much about all of this carbon movement. Maybe we should just care about what happens when you get the energy out. Oh, I seem to remember writing a long time ago. Follow the electron, not the carbon. Follow the electron. Well, the electrons came from the bonds that were broken in through here. So that's what matters, not really the carbon. Okay, now we're on 9-4. Oh. What effect would absence of oxygen have on the process shown in figure 9.15? Well, it would help if we knew what that was. So, I think I pulled that up. I should have already had it pulled up. Nothing like being prepared. Sorry for that. Okay, so here's the figure, and we've drawn that. Not in that detail, but we've drawn that. So we know that's the electron transport chain, and hello, it's a button here. They're asking you, hey, do you think you, you care if we don't have any oxygen, like with this whole electron transport chain? Um, yeah. Oxygen runs the whole thing. So instead of thinking, okay, so we, let's just walk through here real quick. You've got NADH, it's got two high energy electrons on board, like a taxi. It parks at complex one, and it's going to drop those electrons off. They're going to be passed to Q1, 
cube, which was ubiquinone. You don't need to know all this. I'm going to actually go through it with you, though, when we do it in person. But it's going to be passed to this lipid-soluble transfer shuttle molecule. It is not a protein. Actually, it's really weird. You know, it's coenzyme Q, and you go buy it at the supplement store. But anyway, it's going to take the electrons from complex 1 and when FADH2 parts in its space at complex 2, it's going to hand its electrons directly to Q through 2. So Q has the ability to move freely within the membrane. 1, 3, and 4, really also 2, and this, I'm over here pointing like you can see, ATP synthase, these are called embedded. They're pretty locked down. Now, we've gone through this before with localization and how important it is. It also happens with enzymes, but these are not enzymes. So these are pumps, and they need to be in the order they're in. So it would be hard for complex 1 to directly give the electrons to 3 because they're stuck in the membrane. So Q is the shuttle. It's like, no problem, when I got it, I'll come pick them up from you. Hey, how you doing, FADH2? You want to give me yours? And then it goes through 3, hands them off to cytochrome C. C is not hydrophobic. It is hydrophilic. That's why you see that it's stuck on this side of the membrane, which this is the matrix side. This is the intramembrane space. So it's stuck on that side. It shuttles the electrons to 4. 4 gives them to oxygen. No oxygen, nothing works. So what I wanted you to think about instead of this sweet, hey, I'm going to drop them off, and oh, thanks, Q. You're so sweet for taking those. Can you drop them off to C, please? Oh, sure. Hey, C, thank you so much for giving me those. No, that is not how this works. Oxygen drives the whole thing. Think of it like this vacuum. It's sitting here with this awful suction, and it's like <laughs> draws the electrons through the electron transport chain to itself. It's got that kind of a pull. So, no, not really are these being sweetly handed off. They're being sucked out and handed to oxygen as far as oxygen's taking them. So that's the point. A lot oxygen and all of this right through here is the most electronegative of all of those. And so it drives the whole thing. No oxygen, no <laughs> sucking of the electrons through the electron transport chain. So if you don't have oxygen, this guy has a sign outside that says, closed, closed, no oxygen, closed. So you would not have NAD come over here, lose the electrons, regenerate this oxidized, empty NAD form. NADH couldn't do that. So it's just sitting there outside the building. I'm going to open up. Hello. Got electrons here. Same thing with FADH2. No dropping off. This whole complex is closed for business. That's a big problem. So I was about to start writing. Like that you can see. Come on. Okay. Now. So let's answer the question. What effect would absence of oxygen have on the process shown at, yuck, on the electron transport chain? That's, let's fix that so we know what we're asking. Um, let's just be real to the point. So this is 9.4, number one. No oxygen. 
So it's being oxygen. Right, 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 right. No oxygen equals ETC closed. Now, that wouldn't be what you'd want to write because you know that's not a building or a store. So we would write this better. So if there's no oxygen, then there is no, let's see what the process is that we just described. We described electrons as they get to that complex, <laughs> oxygen pulls them through the whole thing in order to glean out little toothpaste dabs, the energy in the le electron every time it gets sucked through one of those complexes going to oxygen and that energy is used to pump hydrogen ions to make a gradient. If you don't have an oxygen, that, that whole thing I just described has a name. That using the electronegativity of oxygen to pull electrons through the electron transport chain to cause hydrogen ions to be pumped through each of the complexes, not two, but one, three, and four, to create a hydrogen ion gradient that you can use to spin ATP synthase, which makes ATP, all of that shuts down. That's called oxidative, which means using oxygen phosphorylation to make ATP. So making ATP using oxygen. Well, if you don't have any oxygen, you're not going to make ATP using oxygen. And so the whole thing shuts down. Done. So let's think about what that means for your closed for business. Let's make a little list. So we'll just write the electron transport chain would halt. That's a good way to say it stops its work. Let me move my notes over here so that I can write this pretty simply. Because there's no oxygen to pull the electrons through the electron transport chain. And the reason that oxygen can do this is because of oxygen's high, remember the word, electronegativity, ability to draw electrons to itself. So what all shuts down at that point? You're going to have no NADH, which this is the full taxi, has the two electrons, it's in its reduced form, so no NADH converted to NAD. Well, you don't know how big a deal that's about to be. No empty buses? Uh -huh. Do we use those empty buses anyplace else? Yeah, everywhere else. If all the buses are full, everything shuts down. So no NADH converted back to NAD. No FADH2 converted, I'm going to put back, back to FAD, no empty buses at all, it, so those can't park, those can't provide electrons, no electrons, no pumping hydrogen ions to make a gradient, and if you have now you may already have an existing one, but you wouldn't be adding to it. No gradient of hydrogen ions equals no ATP made. Done. The whole thing shuts down.
I hope that makes sense. That's pretty important. And I want to stress again, this part right here, this regeneration of the molecules. See, I, this is what I don't know that we have an understanding of. You only have so much NAD. That's it. You've only got so much. It is not meant to be where the... It, let's put what it is meant to be. It's meant to be reduced, electrons added, oxidized, electrons removed, go back and pick up more electrons. It's meant to be reused. Once you have electrons here and they don't get off the taxi, think about that in New York. Let's go to New York in our head. And they've got, I don't know if you've ever been, but like, the whole street's full of taxis. Could everybody function if no one got off the taxi? So you have all these people piling out of the airport looking for a taxi. Hey, oh, you're full. Uh, hey, hey, nope, you're full. Are they just going to magically make more taxis? Or do you just not have transportation anymore? That whole city would shut down because you don't have this, I have people on the taxi, I deliver them, my taxi's empty, I go back and pick up more people, I deliver them. When that dropping off part is not done, you shut down the whole thing. This is a big deal. So, let's look at three. No, it's just, what happened? How did my brain go to there? In the absence of oxygen. Oh, I just told you, in the absence of oxygen, the electron transport chain's done. What do you think would happen? Oh, we're going to try something else just to tweak it in the lab. If you decreased the pH of the intermembrane space. Ooh, okay. Let's think about that. So... There's part of the mitochondrion. Here's my inner membrane space, which we know these are hydrogens, but we're lazy, right? We have a few in the matrix here. And what they said is, this is in the lab. In the lab, if they were able to decrease the pH, of this inner membrane space. So we're talking this part right here. What happens if you decrease the pH? Decrease pH equals an increase in the concentration of hydrogen ions. So let's just pretend that we've got in the red now we're adding these hydrogen ions in this space because in the lab we decrease the pH. So we're adding hydrogen ions, protons, into this space. Just this space. This is the intermembrane space. Over here is the matrix the middle. We're not putting any in there. So, oh, okay. So, what did I just do? So, this would, right, this process would increase the gradient, right? So, increase the number of hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space. That's what lowering pH does. So, this equals an increase in the hydrogen ion gradient. We've now made a bigger difference in the number of hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space compared to the matrix. Hmm. So this would mean, so, 
the hydrogen ions would be there without using the electron transport chain hydrogen ion pumps. Because remember, these are not working. And that's because there's no oxygen. No oxygen, no electron transport chain. So what could you do? This is where this begins to come into play. Well, I'm going to make ATP. I'm going to release the gradient. So you could make ATP. So ATP would be made without the electron transport chain. Okay. Now, you're not going to give the electrons because you're not pulling them through the electron transport chain. It's shut down. And so you don't have to worry about giving them to the oxygen. So without the electron transport chain, so there's no electrons that are being pulled because there's no oxygen. No oxidative phosphorylation. So when would you stop making ATP? Well, I would stop making ATP when these two concentrations of hydrogen ions are the same. So it would be made until equilibrium of the hydrogen ions. This hydrogen ion moving through the ATP synthase to come into the matrix is called proton, okay, hydrogen ions, motive moving force. So at equilibrium of hydrogen ions, that equals no proton motive force anymore, which equals no ATP production. Now, the only other thing that would cause this to stop, other than I don't have an, a gradient here anymore, is if you ran out of what ATP is made out of. So we're going to put or no ADP left. You've got to always have the building blocks to make whatever it is you're making. So you can only make as much ATP as you have ADP to make it from. Okay? The big deal would be the gradient. Once it's dissipated, you're done. But you could run out of ADP, and then you couldn't make ATP anymore either. All right. Time to, okay, so this is 38. The video I'm going to add on there is longer. So this is just going to be what it is. This makes up the real, these are flat out two questions from an AP exam. Now, this isn't. This is just us trying to help you understand. Quit, quit worrying about the carbons. Nobody cares about the carbons. Everybody cares about the electrons. That's what we follow. Follow the electrons. Carbon ball. Nobody cares. Right? They're a waste product. Follow the electrons. But these two questions, ha, they take some thinking. They're much more what we're like. So I'm going to put some stuff after this, and you need to watch it. Like, there you go. So, I'm trying to think what I want to do to make sure that you do watch it. I'm just going to tell you it's important. So, I'm going to add them on and we'll see how that goes. Anyway, I think you're wonderful. About two and a half billion years ago, the primitive process of glycolysis began. Later, 
as oxygen accumulated in the atmosphere, life began to probe the land. And survival depended upon the availability of large reserves of energy, far more than glycolysis could provide. In converting one molecule of glucose to pyruvate, glycolysis generates two molecules of ATP. However, these two ATPs represent only 2.2% of the available energy. The remainder is held in the pyruvate and NADH and lost as heat. In the second phase of cellular respiration, the Krebs cycle, more energy is released by metabolizing pyruvate. The Krebs cycle was named after British biochemist Hans Krebs, who traced pyruvate beyond glycolysis. Inside the cell, pyruvate moves from the cytosol through both mitochondrial membranes into the matrix. Here in the matrix, the Krebs cycle takes place. Pyruvate is a three carbon molecule but the Krebs cycle uses a two-carbon molecule as its starting point. So, an intermediate process, oxidative decarboxylation, is required to prepare pyruvate for the Krebs cycle. As pyruvate encounters coenzyme A, the complex kicks out two electrons, a hydrogen atom and carbon dioxide, to form the acceptable two-carbon acetyl-CoA. The electrons in hydrogen are picked up by NAD+, forming NADH, an intermediate energy carrier. But it's the two-carbon acetyl-CoA that we're going to keep an eye on. First, let's step back and take a simplified look at the Krebs cycle. The two-carbon acetyl-CoA joins with a resident four-carbon compound, producing a six-carbon compound. Through successive reactions, two carbon atoms are given off. But it is the release of energy bundles that we're interested in, ATP and the intermediate carriers. That's the overview of the Krebs cycle. Now a more detailed look at the cycle will reveal how the energy bundles are generated. Acetyl-CoA hooks up with the four carbon oxaloacetate, producing the six carbon citric acid. Citric acid loses water to form aconitate. Then aconitate picks up water and is twisted into isocitrate. Isocitrate encounters an NAD+, forming the energy carrier NADH and oxalosusinate. Oxalosusinate loses a molecule of carbon dioxide, forming the five carbon ketoglutarate. Ketoglutarate hooks up with the ever-present coenzyme A and releases two electrons, a hydrogen and carbon dioxide to form succinyl-CoA. Once again, two electrons in hydrogen form an NADH energy carrier. Standing by, the succinyl-CoA reacts with an ADP and a phosphate, releasing coenzyme A, ATP, and forming succinate. 
succinate encounters a molecule of FAD. And this reaction produces a newcomer, the energy carrier FADH2 and fumarate. Fumarate in turn reacts with water. And the product is malate. In the final reaction, malate encounters an NAD plus and produces the last of the NADH energy carriers and regenerates oxaloacetate. The Krebs cycle began with the prime player, acetyl-CoA, reacting with oxaloacetate. Through a series of 10 stepped reactions, oxaloacetate is transformed to several different reactants and is cycled back to oxaloacetate. In a single turn of the cycle, the energy carriers spun off were 3 NADH, 1 ATP, 1 FADH2, as well as waste carbon dioxide. The two carbon atoms that entered the cycle were expelled as carbon dioxide. So the purpose of the Krebs cycle is to produce useful energy. Thus energy introduced as acetyl-CoA was transferred to ATP and the intermediate energy carriers. Both NADH and FADH2 carry energetic electrons that will be used to store energy in ATP. Let's return to the original molecule of glucose and review what became of it. Glycolysis generated two molecules of pyruvate, two ATPs and two NADHs. The two pyruvates entered oxidative decarboxylation and produced two acetyl-CoA molecules, two carbon dioxide molecules, and two more NADH molecules. Since two acetyl-CoAs are engaged in the Krebs cycle, think of the cycle turning twice. We'll add the final products. 6 CO2, 10 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 4 ATP molecules. Now let's do what we usually do with waste. Get rid of the carbon dioxide. So up to this stage in cellular respiration, glucose has produced four power-packed ATPs and 12 impatient energy carriers. In the next program, we'll watch these intermediate energy carriers deliver the payload of ATP.